human cognition, is it universal? Are people from different cultures and geographic contexts actually wired differently? The short answer is yes, and in this video we will analyze the cognitive differences between Easterners and Westerners. First of all, what do we mean by Easterner and Westerner? For Easterner, the region analyzed is known as the Far East, so the geographic area that includes East China, Japan, and Korea. As for Westerner, the focus lies mainly on Western Europe, the United States, and Canada. Westerners would likely agree with the following list of features. Each individual has a set of characteristics, distinctive attributes, and being unique is something desirable. Westerners think that people are the ones in control of their own behavior. They feel better when they are in situations in which choice, planning, control, and personal preferences determine outcomes. Individuals are oriented towards personal goals of success and achievement. They find that relationships and group memberships can sometimes get in the way of attaining these goals. People strive to feel good about themselves, personal success is highly valued, and feeling assured that they have positive qualities is very important to their sense of well-being. Westerners prefer equality in personal relations, or when relationships are hierarchical, they prefer a superior position. People believe that the same rules should apply to everyone, individuals should not be singled out for special treatment, Justice should be blind and fair regardless of personal attributes. More generally, the idea of the self is viewed as static. Individuals can move from group to group and setting to setting without being altered. Now, the Easterners approach. Easterners are less concerned than Westerners with personal goals or self-aggrandizement. Group goals and coordinated actions are more often the principal concern. Success is often sought as a group goal rather than a personal badge of merit, and individual distinctiveness is not particularly desirable. For Far East Asians, feeling good about themselves is likely to be tied to the sense that they are in harmony with their surrounding net of relationships, to which they belong to and are meeting its expectations. Equality of treatment is not assumed nor is it necessarily regarded as desirable, Choice is not as high as a priority for Easterners, as they see that context and environment have strong implications in an individual's life. Actions not affected by circumstances is something hard to imagine for an Easterner. Easterners value relationships more than identity, as they believe that identity is not controllable exclusively by the self, but rather by the context, a complex network of people, environments, and relationships. For Far East Asians, the self is viewed as connected, fluid, and conditional, and more generally, Easterners have a more complex view of the world, a world made of a complex substance of interactions and relationships, where personal control of outcome is more difficult to imagine and could even be seen as immature and oversimplistic. To oversimplify this, Westerners view the world as a sea of distinct static objects and categories, whereas Easterners see it as a complex fluid of substances, constantly changing and interacting with one another. This is also known as the analysis versus holism, with Westerners being much more focused on salient objects and Easterners on their context and substance. Cognitive psychologists Mutsumi Imai and Deidre Gantner demonstrated this by showing objects composed of a particular substance to Japanese and Americans of all ages, and described them in ways that were neutrals with respect to whether each was an object or a substance. In one instance, they showed a pyramid made of cork and showed the participants two trays, one of which had the same object but made with a different substance, like a plastic pyramid, and a different one made of the same material, like a piece of cork. The investigators then asked the participants to point to the tray that had their thing on it. Americans were much more likely to choose the same shape than were the Japanese, indicating that the Americans were coding what they saw as an object. The Japanese were much more likely to choose the same material as the thing, indicating that they were coding what they saw as a substance. The differences between Americans and Japanese were very large. On average, across the many trials with different displays, more than two-thirds of four-year-old American children chose the same shape as the thing, whereas less than a third of Japanese four-year-old children did. The differences were equally large for adults and even two-year-olds differed. In a different study, the same differences appeared when participants had to recognize objects out of their context. Japanese had a harder time than Americans finding the original object in a different background. Taken at face value, these Imai and Gentner results indicate that Japanese and Americans literally see different worlds, one made of salient objects and one made of substance. 
Language is the connection between our thoughts and the outside world. If one language looks like this and the other one looks like this, then there must be something fundamentally different in the way they influence their respective ways of thinking and the other way around. Coming back to the idea of objects and context, Indo-European languages are engineered in a system of self-contained objects, letters, that together make up bigger objects, words, that have specific functions in a sentence and that have one specific meaning. In English, making sure that words require as little context as possible is something desirable. In Eastern languages, words are characters and their meaning is heavily dependent on their context. For instance, a car in the street and a car in a museum will have two different names as one is a mean of transportation and the other one a work of art. Such thing does not happen in Western languages, which are heavily subject name and object driven. Instead, Eastern languages are verb driven. In a study, Gentner found that American kids learn generic nouns twice as fast than verbs, as verbs are more complex and they require more knowledge of grammar. On the other hand, Asian children learn verbs at a faster rate than nouns, as they are essential in creating the context necessary to make sentences make sense. Also, in Eastern languages, verbs are often placed at more important parts of the sentence, like the beginning and end, rather than being buried in the middle. This can also be found in Western languages like German, and studies show that on this general West-East thought spectrum, continental and Southern Europe seems to locate more as an in-between. Also, in Japanese, the word I varies based on who one may be talking to and the circumstance. The self literally changes based on the context. Easterners tend to be less interested with formal logic than Westerners, as there is a strong distrust towards the idea of decontextualization. More specifically, accepting the validity of an argument based on its assumed compelling underlying abstract structure alone is not enough to prove its legitimacy. It needs to be connected to its content and context. Huh? Okay. In a study conducted by Richard Nisbet, the author of The Geography of Thought and three other cognitive psychologists, a series of three deductive arguments were put to the test of Koreans and Americans, who had to evaluate its convincingness. The first argument is meaningful and its conclusion plausible, the second one is meaningful but its conclusion implausible, and the third one is so abstract that it has no real meaning whatsoever. But all three are perfectly logically valid. Both Koreans and Americans were more likely to rate syllogism with plausible conclusions as valid, as expected. However, Koreans were more influenced by plausibility than Americans. The difference between the two groups would seem to be that Americans are simply more in the habit of applying logical rules to ordinary events than Koreans, and are therefore more capable of ignoring the plausibility of the conclusions or the general context in which the purely logical argument is being constructed in. Consider the following two sets of proverbs. When professors Peng and Richard Nisbet asked students of the University of Michigan and the University of Beijing which proverbs they liked more, the Chinese students had a clear preference for the proverbs with a contradiction in it. Americans preferred those without a contradiction. The reasons for this example of Eastern preferences lies in aspects previously mentioned such as the belief in constant change of the nature of reality, which leads to constant anomalies and the dialectical holistic view that opposing arguments are true. Evidence indicates that Easterners are not concerned with contradiction in the same way that Westerners are. When asked to justify their choices, they seem to move to a compromise, middle way stance, instead of referring to a dominating principle. On the contrary, Americans' contradiction phobia may sometimes cause them to become way more extreme and polarized in their judgment and interventions under conditions in which the evidence indicates they should become less extreme. The why part of this question is the hardest one to prove. However, there are compelling arguments that aim at explaining this phenomenon. A first hypothesis can be found in philosophy, as ancient Greek philosophy hints to many aspects relating to the modern Western way of thinking. And so does ancient Chinese philosophy for the Eastern thought. For the ancient Greeks, frequent aspects of philosophical and political life were rhetoric, arguments, debates, and battles. The Iliad and the Odyssey are tales based on fully formed independent individuals. Their relationships and adventures is what is of interest, which shows aspects of static identity through context changes and a strong sense of personal agency. Aristotle saw celestial objects as fixed and more generally natural objects were seen as categorizable, relatively simple and noble. In the sciences, the Greeks were amongst the first to look for the underlying logical principle and pattern. If human senses disprove the scientific method, they should be ignored. As for ancient China, Confucianism states, I am the totality of roles I live in relations to specific others. Taken collectively, they weave for each of us a unique pattern of personal identity. 
such that if some of my roles change, the others will of necessity change also, literally making me a different person. Furthermore, the idea of happiness was not as for the Greeks a life allowing the free exercise of distinctive talents, but rather the satisfaction of a plain country life shared within a harmonious social network. This can be seen in Greek vases and wine goblets which show pictures of battles, athletic contests and Bacchalinian parties, whereas ancient Chinese scrolls and porcelains depict scenes of family activities and rural pleasures. Therefore, life's pursuit is the search of harmony rather than liberty. As a musician, I see this in Eastern music often being pentatonic, which is the most stable and consonant scale, and Western music is based on the element of tension and release, developed counterpoint, and polyphony. Also, Tao's famous yin and yang symbol signifies that the opposite of anything exists in both sides, hence the Easterners' appreciation of contradictions. But why philosophy evolved so differently? An appealing case made by historians, Jared Diamond would definitely agree, is that geography and topography may have played an essential role in the development of the cognitive processes of the two areas. The topography of Greece is very cliffy and mountainy, with a set of natural characteristics that allowed the development of certain agricultural products and processes, such as wine, olive oil, as well as hunting and fishing. These activities can be conducted and organized by single individuals to then be traded and negotiated as a single economic agent. On the other hand, the large plains of China were more conducive to the development of different crops such as rice, which its production and harvesting is to be done in groups and teamwork. Greece is located at the crossword of the Mediterranean Sea, an area known for its constant trade and encounter with people of different cultures and belief systems. These encounters amongst rivals and merchants may have pushed the Greeks to develop the tools of debating rooted in formal logic. In China's vastness, it was and still is harder to encounter people of different ethnicities and with drastically different views as one's own. Hence, debate and logic would not have been as useful, individualism and the sense of self-agency would not have been fruitful to food production as the success of the individual is connected to the success of the group. To summarize, here's a final oversimplification. The inspiration for this video came after reading this brilliant book by Richard E. Nisbet, which I highly suggest. If you want to check it out, please make sure to use the link in the description, as it will really help us out. This was a rather short introduction to this extremely complex and fascinating topic, so please subscribe, like, and share this video if you're interested in a more in-depth part 2. As always, thanks for watching, and please subscribe to this new channel for more creatively explained videos.